Okay, guys, let's get started. A um, couple of things before we get going. Um, you have a midterm exam two weeks from today. Um, and there were a couple of questions about it. It's uh, mostly short answer. The president usually puts on a few multiple choice. They're usually similar to the homework. Um, so if you've been doing the homework, you'll probably be just fine. They're usually not as involved as the homework. Uh, that said, if people are interested in doing a review session, I'm happy to do one. I would just need critical mass uh, before uh, before we plan to do it, because I have to prepare all the questions and stuff. So, you know, if only one person shows up, me spending four hours writing learning theory questions is not a productive use of my time. Um, but if, you know, five or so people want a review session, I'm more than happy to offer one. So let me know, and we can do it, I don't know, maybe the Monday after, the Monday after class, the, the, right before the exam, if that makes sense, if people want to do that. That's easy. Or you can organize another time. I'm happy to do it whenever you guys want. Um, I have graded your homeworks from last week. I'll have them up here after class. Um, due to the ambiguity in the homework, I graded them quite leniently. Basically, if you had the four or five equations in the proper order, um, even if your implementation was totally wrong, um, you got most of the points. So even if, even if your graph looked ridiculous, um, if you had the, the proper equations in the proper um, order, I, I gave you the vast majority of the credits. So. I gave you eight or ten out of it. So no one got less than an eight. Um, that's pretty much it. Does anyone have any questions about anything? Yeah. No, 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 no. No, it's all it's all written. Okay. Yeah. Are yeah. There, I haven't looked at any like are there problems in the textbook that we could use? No, so for the next two weeks or so you don't have homework and oh, so that you get to study. Um, so But as far as like um, I, not as far as I'm aware. Um, okay. So, and I've read the book, so there, there's not hidden ones in there. Um, are there like past midterms we can use? I don't think there are any posted online. Um, so, I, I, I can certainly come up with questions for you, as I said, for, for the study section. Um, but they're, they're mostly homework, uh, similar to homework questions and the derivations we've done in class. So, there's almost always something about the Kalman filter. There's always almost something about Bayesian integration. There's almost always a derivation of LMS, whether it's weighted or not, uh, that sort of thing. So, you know, sort of the main topics. He's probably not going to have you solve. Uh, he, he never does matrix multiplication that's more than a two by two, and never does, you know, inverses or singular value decomposition or anything like that. So you're probably not going to have to do generalization, right? So, you know, <laughs> you can narrow it down pretty substantially, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, any other questions? 
Okay, excellent. So this is actually a somewhat fun lecture today, unlike the previous one that I got to slash had to give. Uh, so this one is about uh, causal inference. And so there's actually not a whole lot of math in it, which is nice. Uh, the only real math that we're going to, new math that we're going to introduce is the circular normal distribution, which is a normal distribution defined across from 0 to 2 pi. So that's really the only sort of new concept that we're going to introduce today. Uh, beyond that, it's going to be uh, sort of examples from the literature of how people actually go about uh, integrating, um, how real humans go about integrating uh, multiple sensors, uh, whether we do it in a Bayesian sense, etc. Um, so we talked uh, originally, or Reza talked, has mentioned several times that in the two GPS problem, right, you've got these two GPSs and they each have noise, which presumably you've measured, and you're going to use a Kalman filter to estimate your hidden state x, which is the location where you are. Um, and if one GPS says that you're on one side of the bank of a river and another GPS says you're on the other side of the bank of the river, and your Kalman filter estimate says that, or your maximum likelihood estimate says that you're inside the river, um, because it's the mean of the two sensors, you're probably not going to believe that you're in the middle of the river, because you know that you're not in the middle of the river. So the question is, and the question that we're going to tackle first today, is something called causal inference. Basically, how do you determine whether or not you should combine the information from two sensors? How do you know that the information that you gain from those two sensors comes from a single source? So we'll start off with a, a very interesting experiment. Um, this was from uh, uh, published in Experimental Brain Research uh, back in 2004. So this is uh, Wallace et al. 2004. Here, there. And what they had subjects do, they, have a, they had subjects sit. Uh, so your subjects is where the x is. And they have a, a half circle. And uh, on the half circle, they have little speakers at uh, normal distances, right? So you've got speakers at normal distances. And above each speaker is a little LED with a little light, OK? And the experiment is actually quite simple. They, they had the, the subject fixate straight ahead at the, at the LED that was straight ahead. And then what they would do is they would have a sound come out of one of the speakers. And 200 milliseconds later, they would turn on one of the LEDs. So they would turn on uh, one of the peripheral LEDs or the LED in the center. Right? And so what they asked subjects to do, they asked subjects to do two things. One, they wanted subjects to say whether or not they thought that the LED and the sound and wherever the sound came came from the same place. Basically, this pair of speakers, that pair of speakers. Did they come from the same pair? Um, and two, if they did come from the same pair, where was the pair? Right. So, because they could choose any one of these speakers and LEDs. So, where was this this LED? And so, you can imagine that there's sort of two different hypotheses in this particular. Um, uh, in this particular setup that the subject might have. In one case, you have some hidden state x, right, which is what's generating the, the sound and the light. And from that, you observe you know, y s, uh, the sound, y sound, and y vision. Right? So you make two observations, which you can see. And from those, uh, you say that, oh, they came from the same source x. right? X. One X generated both the sound and the light. It's as if you had a, a lightning strike um, outside your house. If the sound and the light came, seemed to come from the same direction and uh, occurred within a reasonable period of time, you would say, oh, well, that lightning made the thunder. Or made, not made the thunder, but you know, that lightning caused the thunder. As opposed to you know, if it shows up quite a bit later or in the opposite direction, you'd say, well, it probably wasn't that lightning strike. It was a lightning strike behind me. Right. So alternatively, your alternative hypothesis is that you have some x1 that you can't see that generates the sound, and a different x2 which you can't see that generates the light. Does that make sense? So you might have two alternative generative models. And how do you combine the information that you observe? When do you say that it is this generative model versus this generative model? Okay. And given that I think it's the same, uh, I think it's the same source. How do I combine those two those two pieces of information together? Okay. Does that make sense? This is the pro problem of causal inference. So we can write this out uh, a little bit more formally. So let's imagine that we have some uh, binary variable, uh, random variable z. When z equals one, we're going to say that. How did I define it? I think I said. 
that is a common source, right? And when z is equal to zero, and I'll say the probability of z being equal to one is equal to zero, just to be clear. So this is a binary random variable. The probability of z being equal to one equals one means that it's a common source. The probability when z equals one of it being zero uh, means that they're two separate sources. Okay, and so when z equals one, or when the probability of z equals one equals one, we're going to assume this model right here, right? And so we can formalize that by saying y, our vector y is some vector of observations, ys and yv. That's going to equal some matrix, which I'll call C1, uh, just to delineate the two different cases here. C1 times XS and XV, right, plus some noise, right? And C1 in this case is going to be 1, 0, 1, 0, meaning that the source is the same. YS is equal to XS plus epsilon and yv is equal to xs plus epsilon. Does that make sense? So that's our, our first model over here, right? So this is a common source. Okay. We can write an equivalent model or a similar model for the, for the second case, which was that they were distinct sources, and write that's y equals uh, ys, yv, some matrix that I'll call C2, again, times XS plus XV plus epsilon, call it epsilon, uh, let's call it epsilon Y. Right. And so this is now going to be 1, 1, 0, 0. Right. XS is, uh, YS is XS plus epsilon, YV is XV plus epsilon. Does that make sense? So I have, I have two different models. Y equals C1 X plus epsilon, Y equals C2 X plus epsilon. Does that make sense? So let's assume um, that we have some prior belief about uh, the location of the two stimuli. We know basically what the, the probability of seeing uh, the sound, yeah. Yeah. Should that be identity? C2. C2. Right now it's saying YS is XS plus XV. And y oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Two different sources. Absolutely correct. Okay, so let's assume that we have some X hat, which denotes where our some prior belief about uh, the location of the two stimuli. And we'll assume that it's normally distributed with some mean, what did I say, some mean mu, that's a vector, and some variance p, okay? So we have some prior belief about where the, where the lights, the LEDs and the sounds come out, okay? And so from Bayes' rule, right, we can actually write the probability of y given a common source times the probability of seeing a common source, so the conditional probability, divided by the marginal probabilities, which in this case is the probability of y um, given z equals zero times the probability of z equals zero plus the the conditional probability y is z equals one times the probability that z equals one, the probability of a common source. Okay. So what this is equal to is the probability that there is a common source z given some observation y. So our posterior probability in this particular case, assuming that we know everything, we have some previous uh, prior about where the distribution of sources comes from, the Bayes rule tells us what the probability of it being a common source is given some observation y. Okay? So how should we combine the two sources, really, is, is what this uh, equation is telling us. Okay? So 
What we really want to know, though, we, we've sort of, you sort of gained some intuition for what this is. And the probability of z equals 1 is just 1 minus the probability of uh, z equals 0, right? Because they have to, some, they're either a common source or they're not a common source. So, so these two we sort of know, right? The thing that we, we don't really know, this one we know as well, the thing that we don't really know is right here, right? We don't know what the likelihood of, uh, of seeing a y, given that they are a common source, is. If we knew that, we could comp easily compute the prior prob or the posterior probability. Right? So what is that in this particular case? Well, so uh, the probability of observing some output y, given that we share a common source, is a normal distribution. right? whose mean is given by um, C1 mu, and whose variance is given by C1 uh, P, C1 P, yeah, C1 P, C1 transpose plus R, where R is uh, how this noise is distributed. Epsilon Y is distributed normal zero R, just like it is normally. So right, all this is telling us is that the, the probability of observing, uh, of seeing an observation given that it's a common source is just our prior estimate times C1, the likelihood that it is, a, or the matrix that tells us it's a common source, plus its variance. Right? Similarly, the probability, the, the likelihood of observing Y given that Z equals 0 is equal to some normal distribution with C2 times mu with C2, P, C2, transpose, plus R. That makes sense? Just running them through that equation. OK. So what, is, what does the posterior look like? So if we assume that, the, that this probability is just for, just for viewing purposes, let's assume that this probability is 0.5. It's equally likely that you'll see a common source as opposed to a separate source. Let's just assume that for the time being so that it's easier to graph. In that particular case, we can plot uh, the prior probability, right? And we can plot it as a function of, and I apologize for my lack of three-dimensional drawing skills, okay? So on, on the z-axis here, I'm going to plot the probability that it came from a common source given some series of observations. On the x-axis, I'm going to plot um, the location, uh, y, v, the visual location of the LED. And on this axis, I'm going to plot the observed location of the sound, y, s. So we'll say that this goes from, I don't know, minus uh, minus 5 to 5. Similarly, this one goes from minus 5 to 5 degrees, let's say. Right. And so if we plot the posterior probability here, what you're going to see is that when the, the sources are the same, basically when ys uh, and yv are the same, both say that they're at minus 5, right, the probability, the posterior probability of them being a common source is quite high. Right. Does that make sense? It sort of makes sense. Like if you see the light and you hear the light and they're at the same place, the probability of it being the same thing is quite high. However, if you see the light at minus 5, if you see the light at minus 5 and you hear the sound at plus 5, you're probably going to say they're two separate sources. So the probability falls off. So we can draw it um, let's see. as a Gaussian Right, that sort of falls off, that has its peak of 1 right where ys and yv are equal, and it's sort of on the diagonal here, right, where they're, where they're equal to each other. Does that make sense? So if we take a, a slice through it, if we, uh, if we hold, what did I say, hold ys constant, yeah, so if we hold ys constant at 0 and take just a slice through it so that I can actually draw it instead of just sort of doodling on the board. So if we assume that ys is 0, we always see the sound directly ahead of us, or we always see the sound. We always hear the sound directly ahead of us, right? We can, I can plot the posterior probability of them being a common source given some observation 
versus the disparity, which is going to be yS minus yV, right? How much different they are. So when they're not different at all, when they're sitting at zero, the probability is one, and then it falls off as you get further away. Does that make sense? Okay. Fairly straightforward. Now the question is, now that we know how much we believe, right? So out at these tails, out at, you know, minus five, when they're minus five and five apart, we basically say we believe they're two different things. They're, they're not the same, right? So the question is, how much does the fact that we see something at, say, minus, say, at three, how much does the fact that we see something at three and hear something at zero influence our perception of where we actually heard the sound. So remember, the, the subjects were asked not only to say whether it was a common source or not, but if it was a common source, to say where it, where it actually appeared. Right? And these things are actually quite close together, so it's not like one's a halfway across the room and the other one's there. They're, they're actually quite close together. Okay? So where, where did they hear the sound? Okay. So we can formalize this. <clears throat> Um, using the Kalman filter. Um, so if the board is just not happy. Um, <clears throat> so if the posterior probability, given some observation y, is equal to 1, we use the top, the single source model, right? And so our single source model was written up here, which basically means that yS and yV are just equal to xS, right? plus some noise epsilon. And so our best estimate is going to be uh, basically the common filter estimate. So the expected value of where x is, our hidden state, given our observations, and the fact that we share a common source, is going to be equal to mu, our previous, our prior estimate of where we were, plus the Kalman gain. And the Kalman gain in this place is P times C1 transpose times C1, no transpose, P C1 transpose, transpose plus R inverse times Y minus Y hat, our estimate of where we actually are, which is C1 times not x, mu in this case. Does that make sense? This is, just the common, this is just the common filter. So we're using the common filter to basically say, you know, this is, this is my, my posterior estimate of, of x given, given the sources that I had. Now, on the other hand, as you can see, if the probability of z equals 1 given y is equal to 0, right, now we have two separate sources and we do the exact same thing, right? The expected value here of x given y and z being equal to 0 is equal to mu plus p c2 transpose c2 p c2 transpose plus r inverse times y minus c2 mu. So if it's a common source we use that equation. If it's a if they're a separate source, we use that equation, right? And so, in reality, it's not going to be equal to 1 or 0. It's going to be a mixture of the two, right? We believe, uh, we believe that they're a common source to some percentage. Only when they overlap exactly do we believe that it's a true single, uh, true common source. And so, really, if we let the, the prior, the likelihood, excuse me, the, the likelihood of... Um, z being equal to 1, no. The likelihood of y given, given z equal to 1 be equal to a, some value, right? It's now going to be a weighted update equation. So all we have to do is say that our actual expected value of x given y is going to be a, right, times the probability of it being a single source, which I just destroyed here. A times the expected value of x given y and z being equal to 1 
plus 1 minus a, because they're either a single source or, a, or two sources, times the expected value of x given y and z being equal to 0. Okay, so just a, just a weight that we've now assigned to these two different state update equations. Okay. So what does that look like? Well, if you plot, what I'm going to plot is xs, the, the location of the sound. Now remember that for, the, for these examples, um, I've, I've fixed the actual value ys to be at 0. Right? And, and all I'm doing is varying where the LED turns on. Right? And so when, so I'm, what I'm plotting here is, again, this is yv or ys minus yv, the disparity, if you want to call it that, right? And here's uh, 1, and here's minus 1, and call this 5 and minus 5, right? And so what's, what you would actually see if you plotted this equation, and again, I'm assuming, we're assuming the same uh, priors that we had before, what you'd see is that when uh, yv is presented at 0, and ys is presented at 0, which in this plot is just going to be right at 0, 0, right? You believe that the source is, in fact, at 0, and it's a common source. However, as you get farther from the periphery, what you do, it doesn't go negative, it just goes down here. What you do is your, uh, your belief about where the sound actually is is biased by the fact that you, um, that you saw a light. Right? The fact that, yeah. What is the vertical axis? I'm sorry, this is uh, x hat of s. So this is your belief about where the sound came from. Why is it varying from negative 1 to 1? So because you're, you don't fully believe the, uh, you don't fully integrate at, at each time step. Right? The, the source of the sound is always at 0. The actual source of, of the sound is always at 0. Right. Your belief about the source of the sound does vary as the, so you can imagine that you're, you're in this room, right, and I'm staring straight ahead and the sound is coming straight ahead, right? I hear the sound coming straight ahead, but the fact that I saw a light five degrees away causes me to believe that the sound didn't actually originate from right here. It caused me to believe that the sound originated a little closer to the light than it actually did. I guess, um, so are those bounds, one and negative one, are those they're not hard bounds. No, no, no. They're not hard bounds. Okay, they're, 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 they're no, no. And in fact, it's going to be influenced quite a bit by the, the value of your prior. Gotcha. Right. Um, so if the value of your prior changes, those bounds also change. Okay. As does the width of the... Of the, the same shape. It's going to be the same sort of sigmoidal-ish, not sigmoidal shape. I don't even know what shape to describe that as. Two, difference of two Gaussians shifted? I don't, I don't know. In any case, when you get out here, What's happening is that the, the probability of observing a common source goes down. And so now you believe that they are two, in, in fact, two distinct sources. The light originated separately from the sound. So the fact that the light originated separately from the sound means that you're not biased anymore as you get out to the periphery. The fact that you saw a light 15 degrees away from the sound says nothing about the location of the sound. You believe that the sound came exactly from where it, where it was. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is, uh, and in fact, so Wallace et al. 2004 show basically exactly this. They show that people's perception of the sound is biased, um, and biased in a sort of Bayesian fashion. Yeah? Did they do it both? Um, did they do it presenting the light first followed by the sound? They always, pr I believe, you, I, I haven't read the paper in a long time, but I believe they always presented the sound, they always presented one first, and then the light whichever one came second, came at 200, 400, or 600 milliseconds later. So what they actually varied was the delay between. And the delay between actually also affects how much you believe that it's a common source. Right? This probability goes down as the delay increases. Right? So, okay. They did not do the, I, I do not believe so they did the reverse. They, they weren't equating the bias? No, no, no. Correct, yeah, no, no. They were looking at temporal versus spatial disparity, and so they always yeah. did it in the same order. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, the math isn't too bad there. Okay, so given that this is a fun-er lecture today, more fun lecture, um, I, I get to have audience participation. Um, and so someone gets to participate in my thought experiment. Can I ask you something? 
Yes. I see what you're trying to do. More or less, yeah. So what it means if it's one? What does it mean if it's one? Yeah. Well, no, what, so, so these are sort of arbitrary axes that I'm def defining based on the, the prior probabilities that I've chosen. But if you want to put it in the Wallace context, you can, you can make this axis degrees and degrees, right? So if the light is presented five degrees away from where the sound was presented, my belief about where the sound was presented is biased by one degree. Right? I believe that is in fact one degree off of center instead of at center. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay, or maybe like a normalized. Yeah, okay, yeah you, can, you can imagine this as, uh, yeah. you can put whatever units on here you want. But in this particular case, you can imagine it as degrees. Right? The fact that I see a light at five degrees biases my belief about where the sound came. For one degree. For one degree. And if it showed up in minus five degrees, I, it, I'm biased in that same direction, also by a degree, so minus one degree. Okay, but in the single experiment, uh, you might not be biased. So this is some kind of average after many kind of data? This is, this is subject. This is uh, across subject data. So they average, uh, they, they did, you know, 10 people, 20 people, and they, they did the same. This is what they get. It's not, I believe it's not one degree. These axes are defined given my, the prior probabilities that we've, the likelihoods that we've assumed. Um, so this is the mathematical equivalent of their experiment, which also shows a bias. I think theirs are fractions of a degree, but people, people are indeed biased. Okay, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, but we cannot really see what the probability of somebody to be biased. No, but we'll see that in just a second. No, we're getting there. In this experiment, no. You're, I, or at least I haven't shown it to you. That's not a probability. That's fine. No, no, no. Yeah. It's a, it's a belief. It, it is, in fact, your belief. Yes. Exactly. Right. And that's based on several assumptions that we've made. Right. We made an assumption about what the prior probability is. We made an assumption about the shape of the likelihood. And we made an assumption about the distribution of, of my priors, right? I have some prior mu and p, right? So given any, any arbitrary data, I can pull mu and p so that it makes sense. But that makes sense. This is just a mathematical construct. OK. So volunteer. I'm going to choose someone. Excellent. OK. So I have three <coughs> cylinders. You'd have to imagine that they're all the same shininess, but not accounting for shininess. Okay. Um, if you come over here, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna mix them up, okay. Okay. and I just want you to tell me which one weighs the most. Okay. <laughs> so stand here, okay. and I'll close your eyes. Okay. I'm gonna mix them up. Okay. You get to feel them, you can't see them. Okay. Now which one weighs the most? I'll help you. One more there. Okay, which one weighs the most? This one. Okay, now open your eyes. Do the exact same thing and tell me which one weighs the most. Um, that one. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, that's true. This was a poor demonstration. <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> So he claimed with his eyes open that this one weighs the most, which I wanted you to do it first when you had your eyes closed to see if you got a different, you gave a different estimate. They, in fact, all weigh exactly the same. Um, right? They're, they're all exactly the same weight, so it was sort of a trick question. But we have, uh, we're talking about priors and the integration of priors here. Um, and so the, the fact that this cylinder is bigger seems to influence people. It, you didn't make a... Uh, I mean, you gave me the wrong answer, but it's the same answer that everyone always gives, which is that one weighs more. Um, and in fact, they all weigh exactly the same. So the fact that we see something bigger um, seems to influence us about how much it weighs. Um, and so just to give you an example of that, um, 
So an interesting experiment was done. Um, Biases people. Yeah, just. Yeah, I don't give you the option. Do they weigh equally? That's true. But why? So if 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 I didn't give you that option and you were totally unbiased, you would anticipate that if I brought you all up here, the likelihood of you choosing the large one would be one third, right? A third of you would say the large one weighs more. A third of you would, would say the small one weighs more. And a third of you would say that the, uh, the medium-sized one weighs more, right? For, if you are truly an unbiased observer, right, everyone's an unbiased observer, and they all, we each measure the same thing. And I present the question in the exact same way, right? We would expect probabilities of a third across the board. It's never what happens. Everyone always says the bigger one weighs more. You can feel them after class, but. So the, this is from a. A fairly old study, but a good one. Um, and just to give you, th this removes your bias question. So, so this was my, the bias due to asking. This is Gordon et al., um, 1991. So what they had people do was they came into the lab, and they did exactly the same experiment that we did. They gave people three different sized boxes, a small box, a medium box, and a large box. And they asked people to pick up the box. Okay. Um, now, the box, uh, when, you, when you pick up a box, you apply at least two different types of forces. You apply uh, a sort of pinching force right, to, to make sure that the box does not fall out of your hand. Um, and you also apply a force upwards to, to lift the box up. Right? So, so I apply a force here, and I apply a force here. Now, they measured both of those. The, um, the, the grip force is the one that's the pinching one, and the load force is the one that goes up. I'll, I'll plot the load force for you. So this is time on this axis. The, the grip force is exactly the same. So, so I'll plot load force. Uh, this is in newtons. right? And so a second is about here. And what people do is when they pick up the large box, right, they, they end up doing something that looks like this. When they pick up the small box, they end up doing something like this. And when they pick up the medium box, they end up doing something like this. Um, so this is uh, large, medium, and small. So before you even get um, proprioceptive feedback about what you're doing, you're applying forces. And those forces are sort of a readout of your belief about how heavy the box is. And so the fact that you have a, the fact that you pull up more on a large box would indicate that you believe that the box is going to be heavier than the small box, even though they're exactly the same. Right? And what's interesting is that over approximately a second after you get feedback from your sensors, you all converge to the same value, exactly the, the same amount of force is necessary to pick up the small box, the, the medium-sized box, and the large box. Right? So you, you end up correcting the error. But in the beginning, we're reading out your priors. And so you have a prior belief about, because this box is this size, it's going to weigh this much. Right? Just like you, uh, you reach into um, your fridge for a, you know, whatever pitcher of whatever, and you know, it's opaque, a pitcher of what you know, margaritas or whatever. Right? And you, uh, you, you believe that the pitcher is full. You have some belief that the pitcher is full. You pick it up and you spill it all over yourself, either because you're inebriated or because you have some prior belief about, uh, about it being a, a lot heavier than it is. Matt? I've got a funny experience real quick that I'd like to share. Kind of on the same thing, because I think about learning beer everywhere I go. And so I'd walk into the <laughs> Don't we all? I'm here to the school this last semester, walking the back from those huge doors, right? And, uh, oh, it happens to me all the time. And, uh, I totally underestimated how heavy it was and just about ran into it. And I've since uh, learned, I guess, that to uh, prepare myself. Right, so you have a, you have a prior belief about, uh, about what's going on there. Just like, so Reza, the example that Reza likes to use is that soda uh, or soft drinks that are sold here, except now in New York, I guess, uh, are a heck of a lot larger than what's sold in Europe. So you get like, the normal large here it feeds like an entire family in Europe. Um, and so we have some belief about how much uh, the size of a, a cup is, right? So if you imagine, um, if you imagine that, that you have some belief about the, the density of a, a liquid and how much that, a volume of that liquid weighs, let's call it the, the probability of x, right? So 
some liquids weigh more than others. You know, if you've got a vat of iron, it's going to weigh a little bit more than a thing of coffee. Um, so you have some, some belief about how much this, this thing is going to weigh. And, uh, and so let's call this. So what we want is the posterior probability, how much something weighs given the size that it is. And so the, we're going to have the likelihood, the size that it is, given its weight times the marginal, the distribution of weights, um, times uh, the probability of, of some size, right? So the, the <clears throat> we have the probability of some size, the probability of it weighing something, right? And the probability of a size given its weight. Now, because in the United States we have these massive big gulps and things like that, right? What we tend to believe is that this is going to be slightly biased, right? And so when we present uh, an American and a, uh, someone from Europe or, you know, some Ethiopia, um, you know, the same sized soft drink, so you observe P of S, right? Your posterior probability of the American is going to be biased because they believe that things are actually heavier than they are, right? Just like you're pulling a door and the door is actually hollow instead of made of oak, right? Okay, so uh, to, to make this a little bit more concrete instead of just talking about hitting oneself with doors um, and Coke cans, um, Let's talk a little bit about um, an experiment that was performed. Let me see who it was performed by. Um, McIntyre et al. So this was an experiment that was performed uh, up in space. So imagine, so we, we live in an envir a 1G environment in which the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. Right? And so we can formalize uh, our belief about the position and velocity of an object, right, that's thrown at you or dropped towards you, right, in a system of equations, right. So we observe um, x at time t plus delta and x dot the velocity at time t plus delta, right. And that's equal to some matrix, which I'll call A, times the previous um, position and velocity, right? Plus the acceleration due to gravity times my time step and zero plus epsilon x, my noise, right? And so what goes in the matrix A? Well, we observe xs, we observe um, <clears throat> x dot, Right, and then this is going to be zero. Sorry, this is going to be delta, right? Delta zero. Right. The bottom is the other way around. You're right. Yep. Zero one. Right. So we observe, we observe x dot, and the position is multiplied by the velocity times the time step, and the velocity is exactly what the velocity was plus the acceleration due to gravity times the time step. Right. Okay. So if we have some so this is just x equals ax, x of n plus 1 equals ax plus um, some matrix B. So I can write that as x of t plus delta is equal to a times x of t plus b uh, plus epsilon x, where epsilon x is distributed, is normally distributed with uh, variance 0 and r. I use Q in this case. And we observe some Y, right, and equals the X at T plus some sensory noise, X, Y, epsilon Y, normally distributed at zero and R, just as they are before. And so the common, common gain, if you had some prior estimate about your x's, right? The common gain in this particular case is actually quite easy because you have no c here. So it's just equal to um, p, whatever your um, belief about the uncertainty is, at time t times uh, the uncertainty plus r inverse. Right. <clears throat> All right, so just the common gain. Right, so if, if you made some observation and you wanted to combine it with your prior belief, 
you would just use the common filter. And so the, the probability of uh, the posterior probability t given t is equal to same as it was before, i minus k times p of t given t minus 1, right? And p of t plus delta given t, the prior on the next time step is just equal to a p a transpose plus q. Right. Same as it was before. So <clears throat> what we do is we observe an observation, y, right? We apply the common gain. We incorporate the observation into our previous belief about where x was on time step t, right? And then we update our posterior uncertainty and apply the, um, the update rule to get our prior uncertainty in the next time step, right? This is exactly the, the common gain, except I didn't do any of the derivation. Um, but this is assuming this generative model, right? So we assumed this generative model. And from that, we derive the, the common gain, the update equations. Right. So if we expose, if we put uh, astronauts in orbit, where it's now a zero g environment, right, this term goes away. Right. This term goes to zero. There's, there's no acceleration of gravity, or the acceleration of gravity is quite small. And so when you drop a ball or throw a ball downwards, right, it doesn't accelerate, it just has constant velocity. And so the question that uh, McIntyre in this particular experiment wanted to ask is, do subjects have some prior belief about um, when the ball is going to get to their hand? So if I throw a ball at you in space, do you have some prior belief about when it's going to get there? And so they attached EMGs uh, to the wrist uh, and measured the muscle activity compared to when the ball um, actually struck the hand. And what they actually find is that astronauts open their hand much sooner than would be expected given constant velocity, right? What does that mean exactly? Well, it means that they have some prior belief about how the ball is going to move in a 1G environment, right? They believe that given the state of the, the current observations and their system of equations, which had a, a G and a delta in here, they believe that it should be accelerating at some speed, and therefore it should arrive at their hands sooner um, than it actually does. Does that make sense? And so actually this, this phenomenon persisted for, I, I guess 50, they did it every day for 15 days. So clearly they're opening their hand earlier than the ball's getting there, and for 15 days they keep doing it, right? So apparently this is not an error that the, the system needs to correct, but you clearly have some generative model, some prior belief about how, these, um, how this ball is going to move, um, and so therefore your actions are, are done appropriately, okay? So similarly in baseball, you know, you have curve balls and you have fast balls, right? We have some prior belief about how balls fly through space. You know, if you've ever, you've always done those physics uh, equations where you see how far the ball flies, right, given a 1G environment. But if you apply a top spin or a down spin on it, the ball actually falls either faster or slower than that. And so you're relying on the batter's internal model, their generative model to be, to tell you that that's how fast the ball should be dropping. And so they miss it when they, Uh, apparently, this was an error that they didn't seem to care about. They just had their hand open before the ball got there. Apparently, they didn't say, I need to correct that. And uh, so apparently, that prior persisted. It was pretty strong. So, OK. So <clears throat> another question is, does integration of my prior belief uh, function in a Bayesian sense. Basically, do, do people do Bayesian integration? We've now seen that our priors do, in fact, influence you, right? You open your hand too early, um, you're biased in the size of soft drinks, and you hit yourself with doors. Um, so priors are clearly important. Um, the question is, do we incorporate the, the prior and the likelihood in a Bayesian way? Do, do we use Bayes' rule? And so uh, this is a, a study by, uh, I think it's, I wrote down Slipper, but I think it's Silper. Um, Slipper et al. Uh, in which what they did was they installed spyware on people's computer and measured the, um, with their consent, um, 
they, they installed spyware and with their consent measured the, um, their, move, their mouse movements. So what direction their mouse movements were. Um, and so you can imagine a very simple, so the, the two metrics that they were interested in were one, the length. It turns out that people actually make very small, a lot of very small movements, about three millimeters is the, the mean of the people's movements with a mouse. Um, but uh, they were interested in measuring uh, two particular points. So one is that, so I'm, I'm creating arbitrary axes zero degrees and 90 degrees. So subjects sometimes make curved movements. Okay? A lot of the times their movements are straight, but sometimes they make curved movements in which the initial angle of their movements, which I'll define as theta i, is different than the actual angle of their endpoint, you know, theta e. So they, they make these curved movements from from the initial position to the, the end position. A lot of the times they make straight movements, but sometimes they make curved movements. And so if you look at the distribution of endpoints, so I'm plotting now the probability of theta e, um, where this is, again, zero degrees, this is 180 degrees. It looks sort of like a very weird star. I apologize for my lack of drawing skills. But people are far more likely to move in one of the cardinal axes, 0 degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, um, than they are to move at some angle in between. Right? And if you look at the distribution of uh, initial angles, it's not exactly the same as the distribution of endpoint angles. Why? Because people don't make straight movements all the time. Right? So, if you look at the distribution of endpoint angles, so this is the probability of theta i from, instead of drawing it in a circular fashion, I'll draw it just out on the axis. Um, so this is, uh, we'll say 360, right? What it looks like is you have, right, so you have Again, fairly high probability of making initial movements um, at zero, um, 180, not, no, this is 180, 90, 180. Slightly smaller probabilities of moving at some angle in between, right? But then roughly constant probability for all other, other angles, which is not what we saw here. It in fact goes down and goes back up. So, People seem to be attracted to making straight movements in some cases, but not others, if that makes sense. So in some cases, they actually make curve movements where theta i does not equal theta e. So let's imagine that you have some desired endpoint um, theta e, um, and, that, um, and that given that desired endpoint, you have some probability of making some initial movement. So you have some probability of theta i given some desired endpoint. So theta i given some desired endpoint. That's going to be equal to the probability of seeing some theta e given theta i, the conditional probability times the probability of some theta i over the probability of theta e. All right, so just Bayes' rule again. So the pro this is again saying the probability of making some initial movement angle given some endpoint movement angle. So what we can do is, and this is again with the only math that we're, new math that we're describing here. So the, the circular normal distribution, which is a normal distribution defined over zero to two pi, um, is equal to one over two pi i not of kappa, which I don't know how to delineate from a k, um, times the exponent uh, kappa cosine of uh, theta minus mu, your mean. So it has a peak at mu across all thetas. Um, and this is uh, called the zeroth order modified bezel function, which basically just makes it so that the probability sums to one. 
Um, and kappa here is a shape parameter similar to the standard deviation of the variance term. So as k goes up, the uh, half width uh, goes, gets smaller, if that makes sense. Okay, so let's, um, let's approximate this function, the probability of theta i, um, the probability of theta i as a sum of these, uh, these circular normal distributions with peaks at each one of these uh, different locations. So you're going to 1 over m, which is just a normalization constant, times b, our offset here, plus the sum of i equals 1 to 4 of aj over 2 pi i naught of kappa times Sorry, we got a little messy here. Right, so I'm just summing four different Gaussians. My Gaussians have a peak at 0, 90, 180, 270, right? With different initial, with different peaks, different values. Yeah? Uh, so these two plots here look similar. So, and that's because of my poor drawing. Um, so, what it should look like is these are, are virtually flat, if that makes sense. I see. So the spikes at the cardinal direction are narrow. Very narrow. And here, and here they're quite, quite wide. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, they're, they're quite narrow. It's just my inability to draw. Um, yeah, no, no, no. So they're different. Um, and the question is why are they, why are they different? Right. Um, <clears throat> so, because the endpoint sort of, the end, this sort of makes sense, right? You have to go someplace. So, you're going to have to, at some point in time, move in that direction. You're going to have a theta endpoint that's, unless you make a, when you want to go over here, you make a movement like this, right? It would just be very strange, right? At some point in time, you're going to have to get there. Um, so, that's why theta e is. is pretty smooth across the circle, although it does have peaks in the cardinal directions. But this, the, the initial angle that you choose uh, is very peaked. Right? You choose, for some reason, initial angles that are close to the cardinal directions. Okay? And the question is, why is that? Um, <clears throat> so, the, so if we assume now that uh, the probability of theta e an endpoint given some theta i is approximately Gaussian with its mean equal to um, theta e equals theta i. Basically, you move, the endpoint moves in the same as the direction of the initial one. What you would see is that um, <clears throat> if we plot the results, uh, if we plot, for instance, I'll do it over here on this board. If we plot a, a distribution which is going to be, in this case, the probability of theta i given, say, theta e equals 6 degrees. Right? So I plan to move to 6 degrees. What is the probability of seeing that initial angle? Right? What it's actually going to look like, so this is this axis here. Right? Here's 6 degrees. Right? And so if, you, if we were to assume that everything was unbiased and we weren't doing Bayes' rule and we were always moving in completely straight lines, then it should be you know, a Gaussian with some noise, about 6. But what you actually see is a Gaussian whose mean is shifted closer um, to the cardinal axis, right? so about 3 degrees. Right? So the fact that you you tend to move in these cardinal directions, moves the, the initial value of your, uh, moves theta i closer to one of the cardinal directions. And so now you make a curved movement, initially starting at 3 and ending up at 6 degrees, if that makes sense. Okay. You look confused. Uh, I was just wondering what happens when you get close to 45 degrees. Or like as you get further away from the cardinal direction. As you get further away from the cardinal direction, the pull is less and less. Right, so as you get further away from a cardinal direction, you start theta i given theta e is, is quite a bit less. At 45, the peak isn't, isn't very large, right? There is a peak at 45, 
right? but the peak isn't very large, so you get pulled a little bit towards 45. But if you choose one right in the center, 22.5, you get pulled very little. Right? Does that make sense? So you get, you get really pulled when you're close to one of the cardinal directions, but not exactly at the cardinal directions. Um, and you, get, you make relatively straight movements when you're in between. Okay. The last thing that uh, we're going to talk about, and we'll get out a little early, is the influence of priors on uh, basically mass guessing, mass guessing, cognitive guessing, Reza calls it. Um, and so this is a study by Griffiths and Tannenbaum. in 2006. So what they do in this study is they presented um, a large group of undergraduates with a questionnaire. And they basically said, if a person is, because undergraduates really are the best um, in terms of making definitive judgments about things. Um, so uh, what they did was they said, if a person is this many years old right now, how long do they have to live? Basically, when are they going to die? Right, so morbid. Um, but what they said was, so let, let T be the age that someone is now, and let X be the age, um, how long they're going to live, uh, so their lifetime. So how old now? So what the undergraduates said is that if a person is 18 years old right now, Right. They can expect to live until they're about 75. Okay. Similarly, if you're 39 years old, you can also expect to live until you're about uh, 75. Now, if you're 61 years old, you can live just a little bit longer. Not much, but a little bit longer. You can live till you're 76. And if you're 83, you're going to probably live till you're 90. And if you're 96 right now, you've got a whole whopping four years before they put you in the ground. So if you're 96, you're going to live to be about 100. Right. So uh, what do these numbers say? Well, if you're relatively young, you're going to live till you're about 75. Oddly enough, that's about the, the mean age for a male um, in the United States, about 75 years. However, if you're, if you're older, you don't have very much longer to live, right? If you're more than 75, you, you, if you're 83, you've only got seven more years to live. And if you're even older than that, you have even less time to live. Right? You're right on death's doorstep. Um, and so the 96-year-old the has less time to live than the 83-year-old. And so the question is, what are people doing in this case? Are they incorporating some prior knowledge? Are they just guessing randomly? Certainly they're not just guessing randomly, or otherwise the means would be all over the place, um, or the same. Um, so they're clearly not guessing randomly. Are they incorporating some previous knowledge, some prior information um, into, their, into their guessing? So let's assume uh, that the frequency of lifespans is approximately a Gaussian. So remember X is uh, our, our lifespan, our lifetime. So let's say that the probability of observing of, of living to a particular age is approximately a Gaussian, one over the square root of two pi sigma times the exponent of uh, minus one over two sigma squared times uh, x minus mu, where mu is 75 years old, right, the mean age of a male, let's say, and uh, the standard deviation is about 15 years. Now, the age can't really be approximated like this because Gaussians are defined over minus infinity to infinity. Clearly, you can't be less than zero years old. Um, similarly, you can't be infinite old. Um, we die eventually. Um, and uh, additionally, um, there's actually a lot of, a fairly large amount of newborn or infant uh, mortality. So there's actually, it's actually biased towards younger years. But it, it, all those exclusions aside, let's say that we can, um, we can approximate uh, someone's lifetime, the probability of X as a Gaussian with a mean at 75. Okay, and then let's describe um, what the conditional probability of someone being some years old given their lifespan. So 
this is the probability of t given x. So a uh, random person comes in off the street. You know that they're going to live 80 years. Um, and without seeing them, what's the probability that they're any one of those ages? Well, the probability of t given x in this particular case is going to be 1 over x, provided that uh, t is less than or equal to x. Did I get that problem? Uh, x? Yeah, OK. 0 otherwise. Does that mean if someone's going to live until they're 80 without seeing them, the probability of them being a particular age um, is 1 over x, right? 1 80th uh, of all the ages that they could possibly be, right? I guess you would have to say uh, right. 0 otherwise. If they're, they certainly can't, you already know that they're going to live to be 80. They can't be 81. Uh, that's 0 probability, right? So, uh, so what does that look like? Well, here's my probability of x, which was our Gaussian at 75. And here is our probability of t given x, which is a flat function which just sort of turns off at some point in time, right? At whatever the value of x is. And this is 1 over x for some x. You can say x equals 80 in this case. So this is 1 over 80. And this is 80 years old. OK? So if we want to see if people are incorporating these prior probabilities using Bayes' rule, we, we now have um, our likelihood function. What we, we need is the denominator, the marginal likelihood, which in this case is going to be um, the probability of t, the probability that some person is some age. Right, so the probability of t is actually pretty straightforward to compute. Right, it's just the, the marginal likelihood, which is the integral from 0 to infinity of the, prob the conditional probability of t given x dx. Right, I'm just summing over all possible x's to get my t's. Exactly like we, what we did in the first, uh, the first one. OK, which can, is also equal to t to infinity p of t given x dx because of the bounds that I placed on the likelihood function. OK. So that probability t is the probability, basically, of, of all people who are alive today, what are their ages? Right. And so if I plotted p of t versus age, what you would see is it's relatively straight and then comes down. And this is about uh, 100. This is about 50. It's about 75. So it starts to roll off. OK. <clears throat> so what we wanted to see is if subjects are incorporating their prior knowledge about how old people live to. Um, and so what we want is the, the posterior probability, the conditional of a lifespan given that you are some years old today. So given that you're 15 years old, what is, the, what is the life, your lifespan going to look like? What is the distribution of your lifespan going to look like? Well, it's very simple. We've calculated everything we need to calculate. It's going to be 1 over x times 1 over the square root of 2 pi sigma, 1 over 2 sigma squared times x minus mu squared, um, divided by the integral from t to infinity of my same probability distribution, p of t given x dx. Right. Zero otherwise. This is x greater than or equal to t. Right. Clearly, there's zero probability of you having a lifespan less than how old you are right now. If you're alive, your your lifespan probably longer than this. P of x. Yes. Yes, I do. Sorry. Dx. Dx. Thank you. 
So this part here is really just a normalization constant to make sure that the probability sums to one, right? <clears throat> and so if we plot these posterior probabilities now, they're not Gaussians because I have these constraints on the system, right? They're in fact truncated Gaussians. And so my poor drawing skills will come into effect again. Um, but let's prop, plot the posterior probability x given t, right? So why do you need to? Oh, okay, never mind. No, 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 I got it. Okay. So you're you are at 100. Here you are at 50. Um, let's do 25 and 75. So if you're currently 30, which is about here, right? Your your mean is going to be you're going to look like a Gaussian. You're going to be right around 75. Right? Your mean's going to be right around 75. All right. So if you're 30, you've got a little little bit of a tail here, or that's truncated, right? And so if you're 50, right, it's going to be the same Gaussian, except now I've I've truncated a whole lot of the distribution, so my normalization factor has changed. But it's the same distribution, and so it's going to look something like this. All right, so this is at, here's 30, here's 50. If you imagine someone who is currently 90, right, that's going to be here. It's going to be a whopping big curve, which is just the tail of the Gaussian, right? But you have a high probability in, in all these cases, right? So if you, if given that you're some age, this is 90, Say, given that you're 90, clearly the probability of you living till you're 75, the mean of the distribution is zero, right? By definition, right? You can't be less than how old you are. Um, so it's clearly more than 90. And so if you wanted to know um, when someone is the, the expected life, or someone's expected life, ex someone's lifespan given how old they are, right? You're not gonna wanna take the mean of the distribution Right. What you really want is where does the area under, at some arbitrary point, where does the area under the curve equal the area on the other half of the curve? Right. What you want is the median of the distribution. So you're going to ask the question, where does the integral from, you know, say if you're 90, 90 to something else, say m, of this prior, this posterior probability, x given t, uh, dx, uh, dx, yes, t equals 90, dx, equal the integral from m to infinity of, and that has to be the median, which is 1 half, right? So find m such that these equalities are equal. And I'm not going to find it, but you can, you can see that, one, you want the median, and two, um, the value is greater than 90. Right? And so, in fact, that's, that's what they found in the beginning. So if you look at Griffiths and Tannenbaum, they, they actually do look like they're incorporating prior knowledge about how old people live and doing all this crazy truncation of Gaussian distributions because it seems to agree with uh, the incorporation of the prior estimates. Does that make sense? But yeah. Then that, that must break down at some point. Like you said, somebody walked in and they were 200. How long are they going to live? You'd say, nobody's 200. Yeah, 200 in, uh, 200 in a day, right? <laughs> you might be alive now, but you're going to be dead by tomorrow. Uh, right? No, or they died, you know, 100 years ago. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, it does break down, but for these, these nice simple cases where you're in a, a fairly finite range, and the Gaussian has a tail that's, that's roughly near zero. Um, you know, for anything larger than 100, it, it, they actually, people tend to incorporate their prior knowledge about how old people are, the mean uh, and the standard deviation about how old people are pretty well. Okay. That's that, has anyone seen those ridiculous commercials where they, they had like, people put dots of the oldest person that, uh, no one has ever seen these commercials? Okay, never mind. Not important. The, the last thing I want to talk about um, in the one minute that I have you is people, 
people, yes, incorporate prior knowledge, but people also don't incorporate prior knowledge. And so uh, there was um, uh, a show long ago called Let's Make a Deal. Uh, the host of the show was Monty Hall, and it's the Monty Hall problem. And so the problem is, as uh, you can do this with parties, you know, party tricks. Um, so you have three doors. Behind, the way that it's always described is behind two of the doors are goats. Uh, one goat behind door number one, one goat behind door number two, and you know a brand new Mercedes um, behind door number three, right? And so you're asked to choose one of the doors, right? And then the host chooses, not chooses, but the host then says, of the two doors that remain, I'll take one away that I'm sure does not have the car, right? I'm sure it has a goat behind it, right? And he shows you the goat, right? And then the question is, do you stick with the door that you have, um, or do you switch doors to a, a different door? Do you think that the money is going to be behind a different door, right? Um, <clears throat> and so how many people would stay with the door that they first thought? No one. OK, one. How many people would switch doors? OK. How many people say, doesn't make a bit of difference. 50-50 probability. Okay. So the vast, you guys are actually pretty smart because the vast majority of people would say that uh, you should, it doesn't matter, 50-50 probability of everything being equal. Uh, so it doesn't matter what door I choose second, I could choose the one that I currently had or a different one and it's going to be about the same. And there was actually this giant debate uh, for like 30 years um, when someone uh, said the, the probabilities of this problem. But imagine a very simple scenario in which there are a thousand doors, right? You choose one of them, right? And the host closes all of the other door, or all other doors except for one, right? right? That have goats behind it. Do you choose, do you stick with the current door or do you switch doors? Does that make sense? Obviously, everyone switches, right? You, it's, you have a one in a thousand chance of choosing the car the first time, whereas the second time if you switch, you have a much higher probability. You're almost assured that that door um, contains the car behind it. And so most people um, do not believe that switching is valuable. They stay with the same door. They say that it's a 50-50 probability and I'm just going to do what I did before. When in fact, there's a higher probability a two-thirds probability that you would get the car if you switched doors, and only a one-third probability uh, that you would get the car if you stayed on the door. So all we talked a lot about priors and how we incorporate that into our, um, into our posterior estimates. But it seems, and in a lot of cases that's true, but it seems also that we have problems doing very simple uh, arithmetic, uh, and sometimes we can't incorporate the priors. So that's the Monty Hall problem. And I apologize for keeping you late. Um, Enjoy your weekend. See you Monday. I have your homework here, too.